Hello everyone, this is Timothée Parik. I'm a researcher in ecological economics at the School of Economics and Management here at Lund University. And I came here to present uh, a book that I just published in French, which translates in Slow Down or Perish, The Economics of Degrowth. Ralentir ou Périr, L'économie de la décroissance. So I want to take a bit of time uh, to drive you through this book, to give you a little bit of a tour. And that book has actually started way earlier uh, than writing the actual book because it's an adaptation of my PhD thesis, which I started to write in 2016. I was in between France at the University of Clermont-Ferrand and Stockholm at the Stockholm Resilience Center. That thesis is quite cumbersome because it ended up being a 900 page uh, piece of theoretical economics and so I wanted to just synthesize the main findings of the thesis into a wide audience book. I was not planning to do it in French first but that's how it came out. So what I will be doing here is just give you a tour of the French book which I've partially translated for the purpose of this presentation in English. So let's start going. There's just eight chapters in the book and we could split them into two steps. First, better understanding what is economic growth as to develop a critique of the growth-based economy. That is chapter one, two, three, four. Second step, once we've done this, is to understand the concept of degrowth as an alternative to the growth-based economy and to articulate with another concept, which is the concept of post-growth. So that will be chapter five, six, seven, and eight. So let's get started with chapter one, the secret life of GDP between phenomenon and ideology. So this, this is a very personal chapter because this is how, this is a reflection of my own experience as a student starting to study economics 15 years ago and I remember having like a lot of trouble to grasp what economic growth was and I was always being asking you know but what is economic growth and then I remember my uh, professors were telling me you know it's just an increase in gross domestic, domestic product GDP but then what is GDP and how do we calculate it and I have never really managed to get an answer to that because it was always uh, that argument was always within the framework of economic concepts that are tautological in the sense of, well, GDP is a recording of all value added and somehow value added is just, you know, somehow equivalent to national income and that is what we call economic growth and we're always referring one to the other. And I was just very confused. So in that chapter, I wanted to get to the bottom of what economic growth is. And we don't often do that in economics. Economic growth is a concept, even though we often talk about it in the media, an economist cannot uh, but use it in uh, <laughs> pretty much everything they do. We don't often spend time to explore theories of economic growth, to ask ourselves almost full of philosophical questions about what economic growth is. Where does it come from? and to connect, and that's why I called it the secret life of economic growth, to the impact it has on what's happening outside of the so-called economy, so in societies in a broader sense, and of course in nature. And so as a phenomenon, I decided in the book to stop calling it economic growth. <laughs> I think that was the, the, the first um, radical claim, is to say that economic growth is a bad metaphor because an economy is not really growing. When I tell you about growth, you imagine the growth of a plant. You imagine a mix up between quantity and quality, like a process of development. This is not what economic growth is. Economic growth is an increase in gross domestic product, which is basically a quantitative indicator of economic agitation. So when we say that an economy grows, which we often associate with progress, with innovation, with quality of life. Actually, we're just piling up points of GDP, which are only a quantitative measurements uh, 
of the volumes of monetary transaction happening within the economy within a year. So as a phenomenon, first, we need to dissociate the quantitative that is measured by GDP, a bit like the speedometer of your car, and the qualitative, which would be rather the direction your economy is going. The quality of what's being produced, the difference between essential and superfluous, between desirable and undesirable, between productive and counterproductive forms of production. So setting this analytical framework will allow us in the three next chapters to have a biophysical, social and political critique of economic growth. But there's something else I wanted to do in that first chapter, is to make the claim that economic growth is not only a phenomenon, but also an ideology. I love this cartoon from uh, <coughs> a, a French uh, cartoonist, which is here representing um, modern economists. So croissance means growth. And so you see that's all economists care about, just growth, growth, growth. And I, I don't think this is an overstatement to say that growth has become an obsession. Uh, we, we find it actually in the law, the, the most powerful way of, powerful example of showing this is the growth duty, which is a law in the UK passed in 2015, I think, which um, states that any public servant, any members of the British government must act in the line of the interest of maximizing economic growth. So basically, if you're Minister of Environment, you cannot do anything that would potentially slow down economic growth. So we need to understand growth not as this objective phenomenon that once in a year we calculate GDP and then a few economists and statisticians will be like, oh yeah, that's good, that's bad, but as a meta-narrative, uh, a new story about progress or uh, framing, basically, or mode of living, or mode of production, or a mode of existence around that specific uh, goal. And my favorite example of um, how absurd that objective becomes in, is when we're talking about the impact of climate change. So if you're a climatologist, or a biologist, or a zoologist, you know, you will talk about um, global warming, the acidification of oceans, you will talk about the collapse of biodiversity, you would talk about, uh, you know, a soil losing the ability to grow food and water scarcity and forest fires and all this horrible thing you would see in a, in a post-apocalyptic Hollywood film. But economists, they would not worry much about this. But if you tell them, but wait a second, that's going to slow down economic growth, then you get, you, you have their, their, their attention. So, Quite paradoxically, we're not afraid about the planet literally burning, but we're just afraid about reducing this gross domestic product indicator we ourselves uh, created. So this being done, I want to unfold a triple critique of economic growth, both as a phenomenon, but more particularly as an ideology, so as this meta-narrative of development. And I'm going to do that in three steps. So in chapter two, I want to show that growth is the pursuit of growth and more particularly the pursuit of growth in high income countries is biophysically unsustainable. In chapter three, I'll show that the pursuit of growth is socially untenable. And in chapter four, I will show that the pursuit of growth is politically undesirable. So let's go all of these three in steps. The first one, decoupling debunked, ecological limits to growth. So now this is, I think, the most famous critique of economic growth. It's 50 years old now. You remember the Meadows report in 1972. So that argument is perhaps the easiest to understand. We remember Ken Kenneth Boulding, uh, the economist at the end of the 60s that was saying that um, you know, an infinite growth is impossible on a finite planet. So, but even though these arguments are getting more main, main, mainstream, there's still a, a high resistance of economists. And the way economists are getting around uh, this supposed 
and possibility of infinite growth is with the notion of decoupling and green growth. So if you've looked at the media discussions on green growth, you often see these curves that you can see in the background, two curves, one up, GDP one down, concerning most of the time greenhouse gas emission. And using these diverging curves, people claim, economists claim that somehow economic growth in rich nations have decoupled from environmental impact. And so therefore, growth is green, that we don't have to worry, we don't have to sacrifice, we don't have to degrow, because actually we are managing to conciliate economic growth with a reduction of emissions. So this argument has been around for decades. Uh, I think it is a dangerous argument, not only because it is false um, and highly misleading, but also because it's been acting as a discourse of delay, basically saying everything is fine, look at this, we're decoupling, so we don't need to do anything else. Business, as usual, is going to solve it all. Actually, this, this article of the Financial Times says it all. Economics may take us to net zero all on its own. I think this is the dangers of the decoupling discourse. And so when I was writing the PhD thesis, I was back then sitting at the University of Barcelona, and I, I had written one chapter on decoupling, where I was basically debunking these claims. And I got discussing with a few people um, that convinced me to turn that chapter into a report. And that what became Decoupling Debunked, uh, a report that has been widely shared since. And what I did at Decoupling Debunked is really looked at the argument of green growth. And I've discovered a bunch of, discovered a bunch of things. First, I've discovered that all these discussions about decoupling were focusing on carbon. So, in all these curves going down, people were just somehow reducing the complexity of environmental pressures that the term ecological economists use to include all the impact and interactions an economy has with nature. So the extraction of resources, biomass, metals, minerals, the use of water, the use of energy, but also air pollution, water pollution, you know, uh, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, all these kind of impact. We call that environmental pressures. In these simplified green growth discourse, they would only look at carbon. So that's my first problem. Even if you manage to somehow decarbonize your economy, well, you still have problems if your growth is coupled with water use, with biodiversity loss, with material footprint. And so that was my first problem. My second problem is that when they were showing these curves, there was just no scale. So they were showing you kind of we're decoupling, but the question I was asking myself, even if emissions are going down, are they going down fast enough? Because we now this now we have, you know, a carbon budget we need to respect if we want to limit global warming to a certain numbers of degree, preferably 1.5 degrees. And so if you're reducing your emission by 1% a year, uh, well, it's not helping much. You will need to do something else. And so these countries that have decoupled and there are only around 20 around the world, I've achieved very, 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 very tiny rates of emission reduction. Rates of reduction that are so far from what would be required in order to conciliate economic growth and the mitigation of climate change for that specific aspect. So it seemed to me quite problematic that we have build this entire narrative of business as usual is going to be fine, green capitalism is possible, and rich countries can continue growing um, without damaging the environment. Whereas like looking at the problem from a more holistic perspective and with the insight of hard constraint given by the IPCC or uh, sustainability science in general, that discourse completely crumbled on its own. So that's the first critique, that growth is not biophysically sustainable because we cannot perfectly or fast enough decoupled production from pollution. So at some point, in rich countries will have to choose either to produce more or actually to even maintain our levels of production 
or to pollute less. We won't be able to do both. That is the first controversial claim of the book. Now, this in chapter three, I'm using the same logic, but here I'm not using ecological economics to demonstrate biophysical limits to growth. I'm using feminist economics to demonstrate social limits to growth. The argument is quite similar, but a bit uh, different. And it all starts with the, <laughs> this, um, this beautiful uh, question that Catherine um, Marcel is, is asking, who cooked Adam Smith dinner? So within economics, um, and you know, Adam Smith was this Scottish philosopher uh, that in the 18th century, you know, wrote a book about political economy that came to be considered kind of the starting point of economics as a, a field of study. And the funny thing about Adam Smith is that the guy lived with his mom all his life. And so uh, Margaret, his uh, lovely mom, must have just uh, cooked every single one of his dinner and took care of his, of his chore. And, and so the story of Adam Smith is pointing to one huge silence in economic theory, which has been to consider, to look at production, to look at value, to look at economic activity only inside the factory, but not outside. So we've been looking at the production sphere and especially the monetary production sphere, but we've not been looking at what economists call the reproduction sphere. So all the things that need to happen outside of the factory as to make sure that, you know, you can keep producing in the factory. Because if Adam Smith could not feed himself, he would have probably have starved to death. If Adam Smith, uh, you know, was not emotionally taken care of, he would have probably been depressed and would have never ruled the wealth of nations. Stuff like this. So there's a lot of stuff happening in the shadow of the market economy that um, economists have been neglecting for decades. And that is where feminist economics kick in. Because as an analytical framework, when you're a feminist economist, you can look at one specific community and what they do in a day of 24 hours. You don't need to care about just when they create monetary value. You really ask yourself, you know, okay, what they do when they work for money, when they work without money, where they don't work, where they just do this, when they do that, when they take care of the, of the children. And so that gives you an overall view of economic activity that is not restrained by uh, the tools of uh, national accounting like GDP. And so when we do this, we realize something very important, that in the same way that an economy cannot use more resources than they are on a finite planet, an economy cannot use more hours than they are within a day. Simple argument, right? And so you have your 24 hours day, and of course you need to sleep, and of course you don't want to work all day, so you have uh, physical limits, time, physical temporal limits, you have biological temporal limits, you have sociological temporal limits. And that give you a time budget. A time budget that can be used to do many different things. Either to produce commodities that you can sell in markets, stuff you're going to be recording in GDP, or either to do something else. Uh, volunteer work, take care of your kids, start a political party, you know, write articles for Wikipedia, play chess or do naps or whatever you want. And so the argument I'm developing here is economic growth as this kind of obsession with creating more and more value on markets or on whatever is being monetized is dragging a lot of hours. It's monopolizing a lot of hours in that sphere at the expense of the rest of the economy. So all the hours, if right now I'm working, you know, 40 hours a week and I'm like, I want to work more, it's important, I want to increase my purchasing power. So I take a second job, you know, 10 extra hours. These 10 extra hours are hours I'm not going to spend doing something else. Now, economists will tell you it's fine because that's something else. If it wasn't monetized, it wasn't creating value. But from a feminist economist perspective, we know that's not true. So the time I was spending chatting with the neighbors perhaps was, you know, creating a sense of trust that is very valuable because when comes a time of crisis, trust turns into an ability for cooperation. Maybe that time I was spending writing, you know, articles on Wikipedia, even though no one was paying me for this, but that was creating a huge value, perhaps even more value than the few hours I will spend in a paid job uh, serving cafes at McDonald's or designing a nasty, nefarious advertisement for SUVs and, 
and, and plane travels. So here we see that from the perspective of concrete needs, the overfocus on GDP growth can be a force of destabilization between the sphere of production that grows infinitely, at least we want it to be, and the sphere of reproduction, which is following a logic of sustainability. So here the sphere of reproduction is going to feel squeezed by this forever expanding sphere of production. And there is another point I'm developing in the chapter, and that is the fact that when the sphere of production extends, uh, it creates new commodities. That's one way. It's what you could call, you know, extensive growth and when the market domain gets bigger. So here's a few examples, uh, you know, like in certain countries, we don't commoditize organs. So in France, if you have a spare kidney and, you know, you want to give it to someone that needs it, uh, no monetary exchange is, is going to be involved. It's just a protocol of allocation based on ethical rules and the logic of the gift. Well, in the US for plasma, it's, it's a different thing. So actually, if we wanted to boost GDP, we could commoditize that process of allocation. We could even go further and commoditize air, like you can see there, or birthday wishes, or a bunch of other things. That would create a lot of new commodities, and so therefore a lot of new monetary transactions. And from the perspective of GDP, that looks good. It's economic growth. But I don't think this is to be considered progress, in the sense where sometimes you just commoditize something, a specific social relation, you can degrade the quality of it. Think of a birthday wish. So a friend that is just, you know, with, wishing you a birthday and just, you know, baking you a cake, even if it's a disgusting cake, you know, that's lovely because that's done in the spirit of the gift. Same thing, you're moving out and your friends are helping you out, done in the spirit of reciprocity. That is kind of the quality of that social relation is around the fact that it's just unpaid. All of a sudden, if we just all, you know, create a market for birthday wishes, we're going to take out, we're going to degrade, we're going to corrupt this kind of like the beauty of birthday wishes by turning it into a market commodity. And so in, in that striving for economic growth to create more commodities, more spheres of uh, monetary accumulation, we tend to colonize social fears that should remain outside of the economy. And that is another social limits to growth, is that not only at some point, you know, we're reaching this kind of social exhaustion linked to a scarcity of hours outside of the economy, but also sometimes some of the stuff we commoditized are going to be degraded by uh, the logic of uh, economic thinking. Okay, last step of the triple critique. So remember, ecologically unsustainable, socially untenable. Now I'm going even further. I'm like, even on a planet where you have infinite resources, ecosystems are unbreakable, everything is fine. Even on a planet with infinite time possibilities, where you have technological progress that is forever extending your productivity, where you know everything can be commoditized without problem. I still think that e even in that dreamy <laughs> uh, conditions, you could still criticize economic growth on the account that it's not fulfilling its promises. In the book, I summarize this as the five false promises of economic growth. Eradicate poverty, reduce inequality, create jobs, finance the state, improve well-being. When we talk of the discourse of increasing GDP, we unconsciously or sometimes even consciously associate that pursuit rationally to these objectives. We're like, of course we know that GDP is a stupid indicator. Of course we know that, you know, produce uh, for the sake of producing is not a worthy pursuit. But we do this to lift the poor out of poverty. We do this to increase the purchasing power of the poorest households. We do this because we need to fight unemployment. We do this to protect ourselves against austerity and the shrinking of, you know, the, uh, the funding of, of valuable public services. And we do it overall. Uh, in order to improve our quality of life. Thing is, when you look at each of these connections between GDP and poverty, GDP and equality, GDP and, and quality of jobs and all of that, you don't find, uh, you don't find a link. 
So that's another interesting decoupling that has happened in all high-income countries is that rates of GDP per capita have been decoupling, so they've been dissociating themselves from indicators of quality of life, life expectancy, for example. So countries, once they reach a certain threshold of GDP per capita, you can keep pushing the GDP button as much as you want. That's not going to increase your life expectancy anymore. Same thing for well-being. Even you can measure it in terms of you know, levels of education, uh, levels of trust, or even by subjective indicators of happiness, past a certain level of GDP per capita, the GDP solution, the GDP Jenny, is not managing to improve well-being no more. So that's my main worry here, is that we're expecting something out of economic growth that economic growth cannot deliver. In a country like France, we've been having economic growth of, you know, uh, for, for, for decades, and poverty has been increasing over the last decade. So here, we really see that the discourse of somehow, oh, we need economic growth to solve poverty is not only false, but it's also acting as a discourse of delay. Uh, we don't need to share the wealth that we have. We don't need to better understand why people get stuck into precarity and poverty. Because, you know, don't worry, economic growth will come rain from the sky and will just lift everyone out of poverty. So I think here it's been just been used as a joker card uh, to refuse asking ourselves difficult question of political economy. And in that sense, I find that discourse quite dangerous. Okay, and that leads me to, uh, I think, this image that I quite like, uh, uh, which I made to illustrate the point that right now in high-income countries, we keep trying to maximize GDP, even though it destroys our ecosystem, it exhausts our communities, and it does not even make us happy. So we're like Sisyphus, you know, pushing our little GDP up the hill. There's, there's a huge recession, it goes down, then we push it again, then a huge recession again, and then we... And I find that the growth-based narrative may have been adapted, may, that, may have made sense uh, in a post-war period where you were really trying to just reconstruct uh, your economy, literally to grow it, to make it bigger and quantity-wise. But now we've transitioned to another period of qualitative economic development in the same way that when you're a teenager, you, you know, your body is going to grow, and, but in your 20s, that's going to stabilize. And then the only thing that's growing is there, you know, as you're growing, you're developing spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, socially, all of that. Our economies right now need to adapt to that new reality of just stopping to obsess over the quantity, over the, you know, the, the, the size of the economy and start focusing on the quality of production. Wow, we've done, we're done with the critique of economic growth, this triple critique. And now that this is behind us, we can get to the cool stuff. Trying to imagine what would replace economic growth as a narrative of development and what would be the economic implication of degrowth and post-growth. But before jumping in all, into all the nerdy economic stuff, I want to do a bit of history. I did it in the thesis, it was a very long chapter, and I'm just doing it in the book in a shorter uh, chapter where I'm, I'm showing basically that the concept of degrowth is an older tradition than we think. And I'm dividing that concept into three phases. The first one is the objection to growth, which corresponds a bit to my triple critique. So it famously, uh, we remember the limits to growth in 1972. So this group of MIT engineers that built a simulation model on a computer and be like, oh guys, wait, you know, we realized that if we keep going with infinite industrial production and demography, at some point that's gonna hit an ecological wall. So back then in the 70s, it was a worry towards what would happen if economic growth continues exponentially. It was a worry concerning, you know, an ecological worry, but also a social worry. People like uh, Marilyn Waring, the New the, an economist from New Zealand, were also, from a feminist perspective, like this unchecked logic of capitalist expansion of the realm of, you know, 
or the economic realm it also can be a threat to social justice if it come and suffocate what exists outside of the economy. So back in the end of the 60s, 70s and a bit after we have this uh, the emergence of a radical critique of capitalism, of globalization, of productivism and but centering on that idea of endless accumulation of economic growth. So here there's a couple of classics. Uh, you may recognize uh, the entropy law and the economic process from uh, Romanian mathematician Nicolas Georgescu Rogan, uh, his students, Erman Daly, and his concept of steady state economics. There's the French André Gortz, uh, who was uh, you know, one of the founding fathers of political ecology. There is uh, the Murray Bookchin and his uh, you know, uh, uh, post-scarcity anarchism. There is Ernest Frederick Schumacher and the idea of small is beautiful, uh, quite connected to Ivan Illich and his idea of conviviality and proportion. So all of these people, what they have in common, and that's my argument in the book, is that they're, they've tried to make a critique of that beautiful word from Françoise de Bonne, the uh, uh, feminist a political ecologist in France that in the 70s invented not only the word ecofeminism but also this beautiful concept of unlimitedness and in French illimitisme so this kind of philosophy of no limits so all of these books I think I gather them as an objection to growth in the sense that they criticize the spirit of no limits being applied to uh, capitalist expansion and economic growth so the second phase uh, is the emergence of degrowth as a word in France in 2002, décroissance. And this is quite an interesting story. Uh, it, it all started with this little magazine. Uh, and this magazine that was published in February 2002 came with an interesting slogan, you know, la décroissance, so degrowth. And you can see, abat le développement durable, vive la décroissance conviviale you know, like, uh, let, and, and uh, death to sustainable development and, uh, you know, vive uh, convivial degrowth. So back then, the interesting thing was these thinkers and activists that were pretty much within what we called back then the post-development scholarship. So people very critical of discourses of development that were very pro-capitalist, pro-globalization, that had these uh, colonial exploitative overtones. And so they thought the concept of sustainable development is a risk of us perpetrating the story of development as endless accumulation, of endless commodification of social relation and exploitation of the living world. And also these were strongly inspired uh, by ideas of environmental justice you find in political ecology. So they were like, oh, sustainable development in uh, the global south is not the same as sustainable development in the US or in Luxembourg or in France, especially if we have limited planetary resources and different histories of development. And so what they said is, if we want to have a shot at a truly sustainable development, of course, they were not calling it like this. Let's say if we want to have a shot at developing a true genuine prosperity in the global south, we need them to have access to resources and they cannot have access to resources if the global north through its quote-unquote imperial mode of living is monopolizing all of these resources and so here you can see how degrowth was born as a strategy for global justice convivial degrowth in the global north in order to release the pressure on the global south release the pressure being a very light term to mean ending imperial relations of colonial exploitation and the monopolization of land, energy, resources and labor time through exploitative uh, global markets. So that was the second step of degrowth starting as a, as a slogan almost. And so that caught up, arrived in Switzerland, in Belgium, in Quebec, in Italy, in Spain, and people liked the term, they just find it powerful. It was a French political uh, scientist, Paul Ariès, that called it a missile word, un mot obus, 
So you, you suddenly talk about degrowth and wow, you know, that people are shocked. They're strongly against, they're strongly for. It puts a finger on the nerve of economic growth, which is at the center of our collective imaginary. Same thing for Serge Latouche, uh, one of the, the founding father of degrowth in France, which was saying like degrowth aims is to decolonize the imaginary of growth. So for him, he was saying it's not rather degrowth in French, décroissance is very close from décroyance to unbelief. The goal of degrowth is to shock, to just make us realize the obsession we have for growth. And of course, then to organize this necessary macroeconomic diet. So back then, it was very much a Western Mediterranean small concept used by a few French scholars and activists. But then in 2008, it organized the first international conference on degrowth in Paris. The concept was translated into English and it became a field of study, a quite big field of study. Imagine the first peer-reviewed article published in English was in 2007. If I remember well, 2007, there was just two articles published within the year. In 2022, there will be roughly more than 100 peer-reviewed articles in English published on the topic of degrowth. If you take that literature just for peer-reviewed article, you can find more than 600 papers on degrowth from 2007 to 2022. So this has become a huge field of study. And that's where I want to mobilize the concept of post-growth. So huge field of study, a lot of books, a lot of scholars, archaeologists, philosophers, uh, organizations, specialists, uh, economists, of course, sustainability scholars, mobilizing the concept of degrowth to try to answer all questions about poverty, inequality, sustainability. And if we come back to 2002, so degrowth being this kind of reaction to a situation of unsustainability, post-growth would be rather that third step of thinking, okay, what happens after? What is the utopia? behind degrowth. If we criticize the growth-based economy, what kind of values and principles do we find behind the concept of degrowth? And right now that literature has had much to say on that topic. There is a lot to read about. Maybe I will recommend first and foremost that yellow book you see here, The Future is Degrowth, which is the most recent and perhaps most exhaustive literature review of degrowth as a field. So that was the three step to give you a bit of a history of what degrowth, uh, the way it's been evolving. So first layer objection to growth, then evolved into not only a criticism of growth, but adding the necessity of degrowth. And then a third layer adding to the objection of degrowth, a utopia of post growth. But now we're going to get into the difficult stuff because I will have to define what degrowth and post growth means and that's really what I wanted to do in the book because I I wanted definitions so that we could get more precise about what needs to be done and what do we want to build after we do that. And so I've got these two chapters that are completely symmetrical. One about the transition, degrowth, and one about the destination, post-growth. So let's get started with the first. All started during my PhD thesis where I started to gather definitions of degrowth. I gathered a lot, now I think I've got 150 on my list. And I looked at these definitions uh, that existed since 2002 and I started to notice that all of these definitions were always referring back to four core values. Sustainability, democracy, justice and well-being. So you would take any definition of degrowth, uh, you know, you can look, uh, for example, at the, at, the, at the first one, and then you would see a sustainability aspect, ex, you know, reduce excess energy and resource use. Then you would see justice aspect. It's in rich nation, needs to be done in an equitable manner. Then you would see democratic aspect. So that transition needs to be planned, it needs to be deliberate, and needs to be socially organized. And then you would have references to well-being in order to live long, healthy, flourishing lives, improving well-being, satisfying needs, uh, happiness, whatever you want. And so I thought, OK, cool, we have these four values. So let's now craft them into one definition. And so I came down with this one. So now 
a little word of warning. This is a straightforward translation of the definition I'm offering in French in the book. I think the definition is French right now is quite better than this one. So I need to work in improving the language of that one so that it works better. But it gives you an idea of at least the steps I've gone through to define it. First step, describing what degrowth is as a phenomenon, a reduction of production and consumption. That's quite clear. We've understood economic growth as this increase in GDP that is trying to measure somehow levels of production and consumption. If an economy grows from one year to another, you know, that's what we call economic growth. If it stays the same, that's stagnation or secular stagnation, if it lasts a long time. And then you can have a shrinkage. So we produce and consume less. But of course, degrowth is not any shrinkage. Otherwise, we would just call it a recession. It is a shrinkage that achieves four objectives. Again, sustainability, democracy, justice, well-being. And the way I would phrase that is that this reduction of production and consumption should lighten ecological footprints. So of course, there's no point you know, taking your economy and just reducing a bunch of stuff that is not emitting any carbon, that is not using any water, that is not causing any biodiversity extinction. You want to look at the most ecologically intensive goods and services in the most ecologically intensive sectors among the most ecologically intense classes of consumers. And then you want to reduce that first because the goal is to get back under planetary boundaries in overshooting nations. Again, high income nations. You don't want to do this in a way that is completely improvised, top-down, dictatorial, accidental. First, because it won't work. And second, because it won't be able to just satisfy the, three, the, the, the next values of social justice and well-being. So you want that to be planned democratically so that you can choose. Okay, we have a set carbon budget and now we need to shrink it of that. What do we do less of? because we know that we will also need to do more of certain things, bike lanes, public services, renewable energy. So we need to just find the biophysical budget to do that, which means we need to reduce other things, SUVs, meat uh, consumption, construction, advertisement, stuff like this. So we have this planning of economic scale, which is something we're not used to do within uh, modern economies because we've always been doing economics under the assumption that everything is growing all the time, so we don't have to choose. Doing economics under biophysical constraint means you need to choose. And if you need to choose, well, better just choose this democratically. Why? Because if you do so, you can do it in a spirit of social justice while improving well-being. So the spirit of social justice makes sense and that we come back to the emergence of the term in 2002 we're not going to degrow the economy in madagascar or in bangladesh of course not the spirit of social justice start by taking into account previous patterns of development and realizing that certain countries today have accumulated an enormous wealth that means, and also that with that enormous wealth comes an enormous ecological footprint. And so these, the, the rich world, and especially the richest among the rich world, also the richest in the global south, should be the one that will first somehow reduce their production and their consumption. Why? In a spirit of social justice, in order not only to just slow down all the impact that is now being suffered in the global south, global warming being just one example among many, but also in order to liberate resources that could be used by people in the global south whose needs remain unmet and who may need or want in the future to produce and consume more. The spirit of social justice is also extremely important because when you're organizing the degrowth of an economy, you need to ask yourself, you know, how is that going to put uh, people that are already vulnerable in a situation of uh, furthered vulnerability. So you want to do it, you want to do it in a kind of proportional manner. And so that's also important even if you take a country like France, where emissions are very highly correlated to income and wealth, you also have the same logic of proportional change of habits of production and consumption. 
Last step while improving well-being, and that is, I think, one of the most interesting hypotheses you find in the degrowth literature, is that they describe this transition not as a sacrifice, something that we need to do morally to save the global south or to save ourselves from horrible, catastrophic, uh, ecological Armageddon, but also that would be a way of improving well-being. That argument is often uh, being built in two steps. First, a very rational empirical step looking at like, look, if GDP per capita are decorrelated from quality of life and have been for decades, and if, you know, the value being created through economic growth is being created in sectors that are not being desirable from a social utility perspective, and whose revenues are being appropriated by those that are already rich, then, I mean, we could just do away with that growth because it's not improving well-being. So now we realize that maybe, you know, we could come back a decade and just remove all that growth without changing at all our levels of well-being. We also realize comparing countries that you have uh, countries like Mauritius or Costa Rica uh, that managed to have very high levels of social performance with very low footprints and so that make us reflect as social scientists um, is there not a way for us to satisfy needs food housing transport comfort education all of that democracy in a way that is more ecologically efficient that you know huge footprint models that we see in canada and australia in the us and still huge but less huge in in germany in france and in sweden so if all these countries, the US, France, and Costa Rica, and Mauritius, have the kind of like same social performance, but completely different footprints, then that is an interesting hypothesis to explore as to how we can just shrink the economy while preserving well-being. And behind that point, there is something else that goes a bit deeper. It builds on a few concepts, voluntary simplicity in Quebec, happy sobriety in France, uh, alternative hedonism in the UK, minimalism in um, the US, the recent uh, Tang Ping uh, lying down movement in China. So this idea that somehow this materialistic consumerist accumulation of possession is not the best way of being happy. And so that capitalism based on this endless a generation of artificial needs and this kind of like work culture just to be able to buy these stuff that you don't need in the first place is perhaps not the best way of just improving well-being and doing away with these pressures removing advertisement for example uh, removing the profit motive and reducing production and consumption as to be able to work less and so liberate hours for other things that contribute better to our well-being than just a paid uh, work could be ways of improving well-being. So that's here what Jason Hickel uh, calls the, the happy uh, coincidence of degrowth, that what we need to do to survive is also something that we could do to live better. In the chapter I do something else is that once I've kind of divided this degrowth in uh, five steps and four values, I'm trying to somehow split different instrument of how to put an economy in degrowth mode. So this is based on an article we published with uh, uh, Nick Fitzpatrick and Ines Kosm uh, in, in June 2022, uh, where uh, my colleague Nick went through a, <laughs> and, uh, a mad review of the, of the degrowth literature, more than a thousand texts, uh, to identify a list of proposals, 530 proposals, including 380 instruments. So the one I've put here are the 10 most popular instruments we found in the literature. Universal basic income, work time reduction, job guarantees with a living wage, maximum income caps. And so what I try to do in the book is when I'm talking about like, well, plan democratically, how do we do this? And then maybe I'm talking with deliberative forums. In the spirit of social justice, how we do this? Maybe I'm talking of maximum income caps. You know, while improving well-being, how do we do this? Maybe I'm talking about, you know, bans on advertising. The goal here is to better organize the way we think of the transition with that compass of four values, sustainability, democracy, justice, and well-being. Okay, enough with degrowth, let's switch to 
post growth. So remember degrowth is the transition, this macroeconomic diet. If we cannot green the economy at its current level of production and consumption, we need to make it smaller. But of course, we're not going to make it smaller, 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 smaller until it disappears. We make it smaller until it gets under sustainable planetary boundaries. But what happens after that? What happens after that is post growth. So an economy emancipated from the obsession of growing that can prosper without growth. That's the beautiful sentence of Tim Jackson. And in my thesis, in one chapter, I was trying to synthesize the values and principles of degrowth into a number of core ideas. Uh, and for example, this, this idea you can see it's here in the middle on the left of useful production. So what is not needed should not be made. In a capitalist growth-based economy, you know, you don't ask yourself uh, what to make. It's like everything that can be sold should be made. If people are not going to buy it, you can have advertisement to force them to buy it. You can have planned obsolescence to just put them under the constraint of renewing their, their consumption. But within a well-being economy, within a post-growth economy, you would need to focus production on concrete needs. So when you need stuff, if you're in the midst of a pandemic and you need mask, uh, well, you would have to produce this. Or if you need windmills, you produce them. But once you've done producing them, or maybe if you need less of it, end of the pandemic, we need less mask. We need not to get caught into this for-profit maintaining of levels of production. We need to accept the fact that the economy is just whew, relaxing. So that's the concept of steady state economy, of just having an economy that is just following patterns of uh, needs, but never getting back into whew, patterns of exponential growth. And now to summarize these principles, I think they were just around 15 in the thesis, around three values. So again, it was a bit cumbersome. I've made another definition. Uh, so if you've been paying attention, you'll see that it's perfectly symmetrical to the definition of degrowth. Five steps with the same four elements, sustainability, democracy, justice, and well-being. In the same way that degrowth is a reduction of production and consumption, post-growth is a steady state economy. So it's an economy that is just sometime degrowing a bit, sometime growing a bit, but never quite either going through rates of exponential degrowth or rates of exponential growth. In the same way that during a degrowth transition, the goal was to uh, shrink the footprint within a post-growth economy, that sustainability objective is getting a bit more subtle. The goal is to somehow preserve some kind of harmony with nature. I really like that concept of harmony. Uh, even Illich and Ernig Friedrich Schumacher would talk of proportion. So we want economic activities that are sustainably embedded within the carrying capacities of ecosystems. Hartmut Rosa, the German sociologist, would speak of resonance. So we want an economy whose speed, whose rhythm, is respecting the speed limits of ecosystems. Again, this idea of the economy is a subsystem of society itself, a subsystem of the living world. And so we cannot have one of these subsystems that is growing infinitely like a cancer cell. Otherwise, it's going to just push against social and ecological boundaries. So here, the concept of harmony is important. Where decisions are taken together, that are principles of democracy, you plan de democratically for a transition. And over the very long term, you want to think about how you make all these decisions. Like the biggest decision an economy does, what to produce and how to produce it. Right now, these decisions are taken by a minority of shareholders and uh, company owners and company directors. They're just basically deciding to produce whatever is making money and they're just deciding to produce it in the way that is cheaper so they can maximize their profit. That system uh, sucks in terms of maximizing well-being and sustainability. So if we admit that somehow sustainability and conviviality as a social uh, objective are more important than financial viability, we need to invert uh, the framing of these decisions. Let's say it like this. So far within capitalism, 
we've had financial constraint and then anything that is social or ecological, you know, you can just adapt based on these financial constraints. If you have the money, you can buy the bike lane. If you don't have the money, even though you need the bike lane, even though, you know, it will be ecologically good to have the bike lane, you cannot build it. We need to reverse that, put the economy upside down, meaning you have the biophysical constraint, which is the most powerful one. You can never overtake that one. You have the social constraint, which is the constraint of need and social necessity, the constraint of the common good. And then you have the financial constraint, which is still there, but it's just less important. It's something, well, once you've decided that you have the carbon, the energy, the materials in order to do something, once you've decided you really need to do that because you're democratically agreed that this is necessary, then you can arrange who's paying for that, uh, how would we finance it? All of that is just, you know, human conventions that can be discussed, rediscussed, and done in a thousand manners. Where wealth is equitably shared. So here the idea of social justice gets a bit more precise because we have an economy that will be running over the very long time. So it's not just a matter of thinking of one-time redistribution. It's a thinking of matter of thinking about pre-distribution distribution and redistribution. So the whole sequence of wealth creation within an economy. Pre-distribution, who's getting access to resources before they even get exploited? Distribution, once you produce something, you know, what is being distributed as wages, as dividends, you know, all of that split of uh, the value being created is the question of distribution and of course redistribution which we know once you've done all of that and you notice there are some levels of inequality what kind of channels do exist to shift wealth around from the one that have won a lot to the one that have lost a lot and in order to prosper without growth this is perhaps the most important sentence here uh, this idea of prosperity without growth from Tim Jackson's book from 2009. Today we have an economy that lacks resilience because it is growth dependent. So like you know a, a bike where you would need some speed in order to maintain balance, we have economies that are stabilizing through economic growth, which is a problem <laughs> when economic growth is running out, which is the case today. We call it the secular stagnation. We don't understand much why but it's slowing down when that economic growth is anyway biophysically unsustainable and when it's socially untenable so in any case i think right now is the perfect time to ask ourselves the question of how to prosper without growth meaning how to satisfy our needs how to improve quality of life without constantly requiring these quantitative expansion of the realm of monetary values so if you put these together, you get these double definitions, 10 points to describe both the transition and the destination. And for me, that has been my way of trying to better organize that debate and to make it modular. So if you disagree with a bit of something here and there, we can change things, but we don't have to ask ourselves like, oh, are you for or against degrowth? No, first we can divide transition destination. And then what do you disagree with this destination? and then we can better locate, and I think that gives us a nice conceptual toolbox to move. Now, last step, controversies. Those who know me uh, know that I love controversies. It was the longest chapter of the thesis, and it's uh, the last chapter of the book. I wanted to end with a controversy chapter because I love controversial concepts. And I think controversial concepts are extremely important for democracy. We need to be able to disagree about things, especially in a time where we want to change the system. And so what I do in the book is start from that flurry of insults you can find about degrowth online in all kinds of media articles and, art and, and, and on social media also. Uh, there's been a strong backlash against degrowth since the concept emerged in 2002, and people have been calling it uh, a lot of ugly words. And so I think here there's something interesting. The fact that degrowth on the one hand is energizing the new generation that see it as a discourse of liberation from capitalism and as a nice utopia uh, to build a desirable economy. And then other people that absolutely hate it and fear it as a threat, as a societal utopia, you know, as a huge mistake, as an economic horror show. So that tension we have, 
is quite interesting to explore and that what this chapter does, it's built on a, a longer chapter I had in the PhD thesis where I've explored much more controversies. You can see them, I divided them into misconceptions uh, and then into actual real criticisms, well-informed criticism of degrowth. Uh, there was a bunch of different stuff on the misconceptions, uh, you know, degrowth being negative growth. I mean, this is easily understood. That's why I made my definition to show you it's not only negative growth. It's actually something that is a bit more sophisticated as a concept. Is it technophobe, anti-science, the end of innovation? These kind of stuff also used to be huge misconceptions about uh, uh, degrowth, uh, which you can answer also rather easily by showing that you know uh, degrowth is not a refusal of innovation in the same way that growth is not you know uh, an advocacy for innovation like innovation is anthropological your ability to solve problems the only difference is that in a growth-based economy you tend to favor solving problems that make you money whereas in a post-growth economy you would still use the same spirit of innovation the creativity in you know, efforts of inventors to solve other problems, except that you would have perhaps a wider range of problems. So you would have a lot of social, ecological innovation, problems that won't make you money, even though they will improve sustainability and conviviality. And then you have, you know, other real criticisms. And some of them I take back in the book where I, I select 12. The first one is the one you perhaps have heard about the most unappealing, you know, degrowth, uh, the word is not very sexy. And I mean, that used to be a big debate like 10 years ago. And I think that judging, you know, looking degrowth being so popular, I think that the debate has turned a bit on its head. And we've realized that <clears throat> words that look radical are the one that we need now because they've not been diluted uh, by the discourse of green economy, of circular economy, of green growth and green capitalism. So there's a bunch of controversies which I won't be exploring now, but I think these specific questions are good uh, little construct, conceptual construction zones where we can both explore a little tensions. Number seven, for example. So is degrowth compatible with capitalism? So that has been, there's been this huge fight between eco-socialists and degrowthers for the last 10 or even 20 years. Uh, about the fact that should we criticize economic growth or should we criticize capitalism? I think this, this issue has been sorted in April of 2022 with the publication of an article in Monthly Review called For an Eco-Socialist Degrowth, where basically both movements uh, of scholars agreed that it's you know, a criticism of capitalism, but not only, also of productivism and extractivism and consumerism and imperialism. And so they kind of reconcile themselves. But anyway, these controversies are a good way to get into the debate and just create new research questions. This being said, that is all for this uh, quick presentation of the book Ralentir ou Périr l'économie de la décroissance, which I hope will be translated in English. But uh, waiting for that, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to contact me on my website, timotheparic.com.